Hello, good morning and welcome back to the fish locker out on the shore. I've took myself right tight down underneath here for two reasons really. The first one is because I thought that rock formation there that looked really cool. You can see all the different coloured stripes. And the second is, is because it is really windy today. Yeah. We're getting into autumn, well into autumn now, and at this time of year you've just got to really, you've got to take it as it comes. Quite often we've got a lot of strong wind, like today. Now a bit of weather in the same direction, that doesn't mean you can't go out on the shore. Like as now, that's often quite a good time to go on the shore because everything gets stirred up, things get washed in close to the shore. We have got some nice spring tides now at the moment. Um, one of the things that I will cover straight away, and I've, I've been asked quite a lot throughout the year, when's a good time to go foraging on the shore? And there is an old wives tale that I do stick to and I do recommend to folks and that's that you don't collect filter feeding shellfish in any months without an R. So you're talking May, June, July, August. The reason being is those ones in the middle of the summer is when there's the most algae in the water. Filter feeders accumulate it and they can be toxic. Now that we're well into late autumn and we're back in months with an R, we're out to go and find some mussels. Now mussels, they are a great shellfish to come and collect, especially in my area, because they are abundant, they're there year round, they're not hard to find, and they are delicious. I'm going to work around in the rocks, we, like I said, we have got large spring tides today, we're two hours before low tide, so I'm going to follow the tide down. I'm going to look around in all the rocks and all the crannies, see if I can't find any crabs, any lobsters, anything interesting like that, and hopefully collect just something delicious to eat. Mussels. Let's go! Making my way a little bit further down the shore, you can see I'm in the full blast. I'm out of the wind now, and now I'm in it. Yeah, these are the areas of mussels that I was talking about. We do have good collections of them, but these are all a little bit too small. Now what they do is they hang onto a rock really tight. I have a decent one. Yeah, blue pit a moment. Here's one I collected earlier. This is about the size of mussels that I'm looking for today. And this part here, this little furry beard, is called a byssus. And that is how they hang onto the rocks. So what they do is they'll use that little beard to latch on like an anchor that holds them on. So all of these are all held on all together. Now they're all a bit small, like I say, this is the size that I'm looking for. When you're collecting mussels, when you're collecting anything, when you're foraging anything, it doesn't matter if it's mushrooms or if it's berries or if it's, don't take everything in one area. So if you come up to an area like this, take one, take one, take one, take one, take one. Take one from ever so many. Don't take everything from, from, from one specific spot. And that's just because if you take everything from a specific spot, if you take everything from a specific spot, there's no way that that can reproduce. There's no way they can, they can offer each other shelter. They all anchor down together. So mussels, like I say, one from everywhere, not all from one place. I've moved further down the shoreline now and you can see as I was saying they're all getting bigger there's a good one and I might take that one and I think I'll take that one oh, that one's a good one there so like I say one or two from a few different places, not all of one clump. And one of the beauties about this is, <laughs> you talk about how big is a portion. If you're collecting the smaller ones, you'd have to collect 20 instead of collecting eight of one of these bigger ones. Because they are, the, oh, they are a good size. Oh, coincidentally, that seaweed on there, I get asked quite a bit about edible seaweed. That seaweed you can see on there, the green stuff, that is sea lettuce. There are actually, there are no poisonous, there are no toxic seaweeds. <laughs> so technically all of them are edible. Some are just nicer to eat than others. That there, that sea lettuce is quite nice. It's gusting a bit now, isn't it? You can see there how they're all offering shelter to each other. By taking just one out of that group, it's not going to hurt the group at all.
There is a big dahlia anemone. There is a little brown edible crab. And that there, that's what caught my eye. That is a big spiny starfish. Now they aren't edible, but they are quite cool to see, aren't they? The big one. There's all sorts, as soon as you find a little sheltered area, I mean, them, them anemones that you can see there, look. There's sea squirts, sponges. Well, we're living in that little hole up there. Yeah, as soon as you find a sheltered little area, there's just life everywhere. These are all anemones. Get out of here before water goes on me willies. People worrying about me walking over the top of them. You don't realise how hard these shells are. I mean they live right in amongst like the roughest, most turbulent water possible. So they are tough. They're used to rocks being thrown on them, used to all sorts. And if accidentally, if you do crack one, something will just eat it. A little fish, a little crab, a little prawn, something like that. Yeah. Obviously, <laughs> don't go out your way to start stamping on stuff. But yeah, they are tough. There's a nice one there. You're better off, you're better off leaving that beard in, that little bisous. Because what I'm going to do is I'm going to take some seawater home with me in this bucket and I'm going to allow these to purge for a while. I'm going to allow, to sit, allow them to sit in clean seawater for a while because if they've got any sand in them, I'm going to want them to spit it out. Otherwise, it's going to be in the, in the food that we cook. If you pull the beard out, it kills them. So they're better off if you can leave a beard in and then purge them and then just before you're about to eat them, about to cook them, take the beards off. We've got We've got a nice collection of mussels in there now. We've probably got a feed of mussels in there. So I'll just carry on and I'll just make my way down to the low tide line. If I find anything else, like a lobster or a crab, that's brilliant. But as far as I'm concerned, this has already been a win. Yeah, there is. There is a lot of good ones here. You can afford to, to pick out the better ones. There's one. There's a nice big one. There's a big one there too. Stick that in the bin on the way out. Yeah. Anything like that, any discarded fishing net or something, or a bit of rope, I'm gonna take it with you because you might end up finding a seabird wrapped up in it. Just put it in the bin on the way out. I have found one, but it's right on the edge of here, look. Female. Now that is a female brown edible crab. Now unfortunately, she's too small. She is about she's about five mil, five to ten mil too small. She's got to put her back. Yeah, that's what you're looking for. And I was just looking in the little cracks and crannies like that, so we'll just let her go back in there and around. I was just scouting about in here and I thought, oh, I'll have a little look down there. And I think I can see, <laughs> I think I can see the claw of a little tiny lobster. 
I'll see if I can show you it. Oh, yep, there is one in there. Just right at the back. I see it moving. Yeah, there is a little one right at the back. Now, I have got James's foraging hook. I might see if I can get it. I didn't bring my torch. Yeah, I'll have a little rake about and see if I can't get it out. Unfortunately, James's little foraging hook. I didn't bring mine with me. Just because I didn't expect that I'll be finding anything in any of these deep holes. Uh, so I just brought James's small one because it fits inside my bag. Yeah, and it's just right at the back of this hole. But it's, as you can see, it's, it's too deep. Come on, let go. I can just get to it, I can get it so that it's biting all the end of the hook. But yeah, the hole's just too deep. It was only a little one anyway. Yeah, it was nice to see. There are quite a lot of prawns around. I'm just having a little quick rake about in here. I don't know if you can see all the prawns coming out. Not much else to see other than little crabs. It was nice to see that little lobster, it was a shame I couldn't get it out. But the tide's turned now anyway. The tide's turned and it's coming back in. Plus, I need to get out of here because <laughs> James has got a cross-country race today. So yeah, we've um, got a cracking little bucket of mussels. And I'll whip my way back along the shore now, back to the van. I'll pick up some fresh seawater on the way back to let these purge overnight. And if I find anything else interesting, I'll show you. What I'm going to do now is all my mussels I'm going to give them a quick sort, make sure there's no duff ones or no smaller ones that have snuck in there, give them a wash up, collect some of this clean seawater here, and they can purge in that for the next 24 hours. I did find another piece of trawl net. Now that's... <laughs> fishermen don't purposefully discard that, because it costs some money, it's just accidental. But yeah, if you can find some of it, I mean... That stuff would, would survive in the ecosystem for God, hundreds of years until it all gets broken down. So you're better off if you can just pick it up and just stick it in a bit. Anyway, yeah, I'll get these cleaned off and we'll get going. And there's the mussels. Now I've had them in this bucket of clean seawater and all this is, is it's just, just like a tropical fish tank aerator. I got it off eBay. They've been in there for 24 hours now and you can see all the sand that they've thrown out. Now they've purged all that sand out. And have you noticed, they've re-shot re out a load of them beards, so now they're all connected together. Yeah, brilliant. Just a little aerator like that, and some clean seawater. And they'd survive for ages. They'd survive for a week in there like that. And I brought all the mussels round to see Jim at Spargo's kitchen. Hello, it's a long time since we were here last. Summer has gone and it's autumn. So oh, no, it's, it's, it's definitely, it's pouring well, down the rain outside. But it's muscle time then, yeah. isn't it? And uh, John has foraged a lovely couple of portions of uh, mussels. I mean, they look fantastic. First comes the cleaning which we will set about to in a moment. We're just going to, with the aid of a spoon, pull the beards out and scrape any nasties off the shell. Give them a good rinse in clean water. And we're going to cook two mussel dishes. We'll do the classic mou marinière with some lovely crusty sourdough bread and a sort of a Spanish Basque dish with smoked bacon lardons, the last of our cherry tomatoes from the greenhouse, and sweet Romano red peppers. A, a splash of white, good dry white wine. Uh, right, John, to the cleaning. Mm. I've rolled my sleeves up. All you're going to use is I'm just going to use uh, the back of the teaspoon to scratch the mussels and any little bits of debris off. And then I'll show you, it's quite difficult actually. The beards, the biceps, is what holds the mussels to the rocks. So as you can imagine, they're in there quite tough. You do have to put a little bit of elbow grease behind it sometimes to, to pull them out, don't you? 
Some of them are quite clean. They've only got one or two barnacles on, but the other ones I've got a really good crusting like that. So the beards just to come off, any bits of seaweed and the barnacles. If you don't fancy cleaning them, you can always go to your local fishmonger supermarket and buy a bag ready prepared. <laughs> Like I say, all I'm using is the back of a spoon. People can use the back of a knife, but you've got no chance of cutting yourself with a spoon, so that's all I've been using. And you just, you literally knock them off like that. Now you can do this on the rocks. The way I've always done it before is you just rub them together and eventually they will break, them, will break the barnacles off each other. But it's quicker to just do it like this. And we will be putting the right juices through a very fine strainer, which yeah. will catch the residue of any grit. The uh, the purging that I did, I, keep, I kept them in this bucket of water for, for 24 hours with an aerator in it. And you can still see, even in that time, they've, they've still thrown out a little bit more sand. So yeah, I definitely recommend doing that. Right, the beards, the bises, it can be difficult to get out. There. It doesn't matter if you can't get it all out. You've just got to watch for it when you're eating it because it is tough. I use a small curved veg vegetable paring there you knife. Are. And remember, any muscles that are open and don't close with a tap, yeah. uh, throw them away. They are inedible. Something that we've we've talked about before and there's always somebody that tries to contradict you says oh I've eaten all them muscles all my life and I've never got sick you. so well personally I, I don't think one muscle is worth the risk of having food poisoning you. no but yeah if you've see all of these these are all tight tight shut if they're open and when you tap them if they're alive they will close back up again but if they're open and you tap them and they stay open it means they're dead now you don't know how long they've been dead for and bacteria builds up very quickly inside of seafood so they're not worth, not worth the risk. We've cleaned all the mussels and all our fingers are still intact. This is what they're like when they've been cleaned and prepped. No barnacles and bits on and we've taken the beans out as best as we can. The mussels have been cleaned and they are waiting patiently in a colander. I'm just chopping up some shallot. Nice and finely. And I'll sweat this down in some butter, add the garlic. We've got enough mussels for two. We were just talking about this. There's enough. It all depends on how big your how big your appetite is as to how big a portion is, isn't it? That will do us nicely. I was saying to John if we'd gathered too much mussels if you cook them and remove the cooked meat from the shells it can be frozen successfully I've got this big pan on a low heat because I want that super hot to throw the mussels into and I've got a smaller pan warming I'm going to put some butter into and we'll oh, it's about a, an ant there just let the butter melt down this is a question and you know like we have like a dash and a smidge and a tad and a yeah. how much is a knob when people say a knob of butter about four tads <laughs> I was just going to say, is it just, yeah. is it like anything or is it, is it like no, when they well, say like, it's a, it's oh, dash is the same as, is what, 10 mils? No, oh. a tad is, a, well, you see, there's a tad. I mean, it's much bigger than a dash. So, uh, you know, a, a knob would be about a, a quarter of that. Yeah. Uh, these are... Uh, not specific, <laughs> but they are. Required. I was just thinking there when we we're talking about a portion. Well, a portion's always relative. Yeah, well, is, is, is a knob of butter ev relative? Everything is 
relative, isn't it? But it's a, an experience thing. I mean, there are, there are some things in life that just can't be quantified or they have to be accepted. Uh, they're passed on or they're an inherent uh, ability you have. Uh, you know, some knobs come easily to some people. Yeah. And I, I just realised yeah. what I've said. Then. Yeah, <laughs> I was waiting for you to say, all, <laughs> all knobs are different. Yeah, I was waiting for you to say it, Jim. Uh, no, uh, this is uh, this is uh, a good trick about getting a garlic right. out. That I've oh. seen loads of people do different ones. Oh, right. you just uh, we're going to chop this very finely, so its appearance isn't uh, of any consequence. No, but you you crush it so that the skin yeah. comes off easier, don't That's you? Right, and then with a small knife, you just take off the little rooty bit. Um, no salt in any of these sauces because the mussel stock will be salty enough. incredibly It's almost salty. like brine, isn't it, it? We may have to uh, let it down. So you wouldn't want to be reducing it. Oh, save those bits for the for the next dish. Sorry, all of the offcuts for little pieces like this just goes up to oh, the allotment. They do, they yeah. So there's... But nothing cooked. No, nothing cooked. Uh, don't want to encourage any rats. Uh, right, I'll crack the gas up. This pan is steaming. So, our washed mussels. I'm going to put those there's going to be a so big there's no, there's no water in there though. No, no hot hot pan i'm gonna put the lid on get rid of that this is a dry white wine couldn't get mcguigan's the shop of sorry <laughs> sorry it's yeah. sneezing me <laughs> oh. create some steam and a wonderful aroma. You can use non-alcoholic wine there, there's no... Oh, yeah. And you, you could use a cup of water just to create some steam, but the pan must be hot. I'm gonna leave those alone, and then we'll do that lovely platter clatter, which is so sought after by some of our viewers. Uh, right, a quick slur, uh, tea, and then uh, we'll continue. Right. Uh, just move the onion garlic onto the very small uh, gas ring at the You're bottom. keeping the lid on there so they soften without yeah, I colour. I don't want any colour. So we're going to give these a stir. So they've been on there a scant two minutes. So you can see they're starting to open. Leave those be until they open fully. Right, well it's a minute and a half on, and as you can see, they're now beginning to pop open. I like that clacking sound. It's the most satisfying, isn't it? Ben? So they've they've literally they've had maybe four minutes up there and they're already the starting to pop. The whole cooking process will be about a scant five minutes. Gas off and they're all, as far as I can see, so open. Let me just swing this round, I'll keep holding the envelope for you then. Actually, doing this the wrong way around. If we pop the colander in there, John. That will collect all the juices and the mussels. You can see already <laughs> the little tiny bits of beards. Right, ready? <laughs> There is all the juices there into the. They can go to there. This is my flour sifter. We'll try that again. <laughs> now, that's the wine and the muscle juices. There we go. Yeah. You must strain it because you don't want those gritty bits. We did as much as we could, but you can, you'll never get it all. Oh, no. And these were foraged on the North Cornish coast, so they are washed by Atlantic rollers. Uh, I prefer those to estuary mussels, which can often contain a lot of 
silt. Hmm. Uh, I was getting ahead of myself. I was going to decant some of this into the shallots, but we must taste it first because, as I said, uh, it's salty. <laughs> oh my god! <laughs> <laughs> no salt <laughs> needed. <laughs> you could. Yeah, we could manufacture our own so I'm going to have to let this down we will be adding quite a bit of cream that was about a half a pint of cold water a clean spoon <laughs> I'd tasted it myself before Jim did it and I was like that's going to taste <laughs> oh the joy of cooking well a salt bath it would um, Cure of most skin complaints. Anyway, uh, let's sally forth and do a bit more. Uh, right, come over, John. Here we have our two so, finely chopped shallots, shallots, yep. shallots and the garlic. Uh, this is the. Ooh, the smell when you've taken no, the lid off. No, you've just, up that. Uh, this is the mussels stock from the white wine and the. So there was there was no other water added to them. It was just no, wine, wasn't just it? Just wine and the juices that yes. will come out of the mussels. We'll keep. That. Sorry, we'll keep that for the next dish. We'll lump up the gas, and I've got a what is that, John? Three hundred. Three hundred mil. mil of double cream. So uh, let's whack that in. Good handful of. This is flat leaf parsley, stalks and all. It's all very flavoursome. No difference between flat leaf parsley and curly parsley, well, just, just this, one's this curly is, and one's flat. This is, I suppose, has a slightly peppery flavour to it. I don't want to reduce that because that mix is so salty. So I'm going to mix some soft butter with plain flour. Just to thicken it. Just gonna All right, so instead it. of reducing it to thicken it, yeah. you're adding something to it to thicken We're it. Yes. I mean, you could you could use a bit of corn flour let down with some cold water. That would be the same. This is just ordinary plain flour, sort of equal quantities. And then uh, as it comes up to heat, the sauce will cook the flour out and you won't get a taste of raw flour. So just going to make this into a paste. Right, there we have our paste of butter and flour. Equal quantities, I mean that was barely an ounce of each. So just as the sauce is warm, First bit incorporated. That whisk's seen some whisky, hasn't it? It certainly has. It's very comfortable. Just keep that on. A Is it one of those ones where even if I bought you one to replace it, you wouldn't use the replacement? Oh, I would. Indeed. So we'll leave that ticking away on a low light. While Jim's having a quick tidy down, because we're cooking two dishes of these muffles, I'm separating them into two groups. There were some of them where we couldn't get all of the beards out. One of the dishes that we're making doesn't require the mussels to be in their shells. So the mussels with the little tiny beards still attached. As you can see, there's some of those where the little beards are still inside of the shells. I'm separating those out. I'll shell them and take the beards out. The other ones where we could get all the beards out are going to go into the marinier. Now we're going to do the sort of Basque dish. Slightly improvised. Uh, Deep frying pan, generous amount of olive oil. You could do a mix of olive oil and butter if you wished. These are the sweet Romano peppers, the long pointy ones. And marinier sauce, I just left on a low light for a few minutes just on a very quiet tip just to make sure that there's no flowery taste. We'll come back and just check that for seasoning it may want a little pepper but we'll probably put a 
squeeze of lemon juice in there. Thank goodness for glamorous assistance. We've got smoked, smoked bacon lard on, which I completely forgot. Should have put them in, would have been sensible to have put these in first and then cook the vegetables in the fat. But yeah, never too late. To be honest, I blame myself really because I ask too many questions that I'm distracting. Yeah. I, I blame myself for that one. There we go. Now, let's be a bit chefy, shall we? There we go. Never ever happens that. One of the things that I don't know about this cooking that we do is the, the colours. I don't, they didn't quite transfer across into the videos, but yeah, the colours and the smells. Oh, yeah. The smells especially, I wish that I could, I wish that I could accurately tell you all right, but yeah, they're, they're wonderful. I'm going to finish off all I'm doing is, I'm, like I said, I'm, I'm shelling off some of the mussels ready for this dish. This has been on a five or six minutes, and as you can see, it's coming down nicely. It's I wish I'd remember to cook the bacon first because it would have been browned the bacon. Browned and a little crispy. Anyway, little dry thyme. Remains of that garlic, very roughly chopped. Authentically, you would have used Spanish paprika, but I rather like the smoked paprika, and I know John does too. So we're going to put in a. This is the last of our greenhouse cherry tomatoes. Um, they'll go into. And I'm just going to let this cook out the seasoning we've just put in. And then I'm going to add a splash of about a glass of the white wine and some of the mussel stock. Glass of wine. Oh, splash of that. Let's get this masses of parsley in there. Lovely colours. In, indeed, it's like a, you could make a national flag out of that, couldn't you? To give this dish some extra bulk, this is just my own doing, I've taken out from the freezer some of my uh, breadcrumbs. I'm going to pan fry those in butter with some mixed herbs and what I'm going to do is when they're brown and toasty I'm going to put them over the top of the dish just to bulk it out. You could, an alternative is we've got some crusty bread you could cut that down into small cubes and fry those as croutons. Mm. They would be lovely. A little bit of olive oil. That's a big knob in there. Right, that's a that's not a knob job, that's a few ounces of butter. In with the breadcrumbs. What uh, herbs did you mix in there? Did you have a bit of thyme? Oh, I had a put a bit of thyme in there and some Italian herbs and there's some of the pars the last of the parsley stalks and leaves. These are the mussels for the marinette and these are the shelled mussels for the basque sauce. Right, I'm just, I've got half a lemon there and I'm just going to squeeze the juice in and then we'll scatter some of the mussel meat in. There's not a lot of mussel meat there but we've got a couple of dozen mussels. Which is, it's exactly, it's, it's two dozen in each. They, um, they're not going in there to cook though, they're already cooked, they're just going in there to take up some heat, aren't they? To warm them, get them hot, yeah, keep them through. I'm going to transfer this to a warmed dish. We've tasted it again and added a little more black and white pepper. But it's approaching tea time. So I'm just going to put that into the oven to warm and then we'll fall into that in a no. Right, getting near to eating time and I brought the more marinière sauce up to a 
heat again. Right. Before adding the mussel, I'm going to just taste it. Oh, that is delicious. Just a very faint underlying brininess to it. It isn't mm. salty, but it's briny. The squeeze juice of half a lemon, just to lift it up. Now, there's our mussels. I'm not going to tip them in because as you saw earlier, there will be don't need to cook these. You get good mussels when they are stunning. I mean, look how vibrant and orange they are inside there. And there's a little liquid there, but I'm not going to use that because that too will have, uh, yes, you can see Particles, the silt. Yeah. So, just give those a, one more lovely thinky thanky. I bet this is the soundtrack for Thomas the Tank Engine when they're Cuffing the trucks up here now. Or shoveling coal leading into the hopper. Uh, here's some chicken escallops, which is for James's uh, tea. And uh, Carol, I made those yesterday. Just bought a couple of chicken breasts to slice them, hit them with my meat mallet, uh, plain flour, egg, and breadcrumbs. They've only taken a couple of minutes. From James, James's seafood tastes haven't yet broached onto shellfish like mussels and clams. I mean, he, he likes eating crabs and lobsters, but he's not quite worked himself over onto this yet. My best boy is enjoying his chicken escalopes and chips, and the rest is about to be served. And we've got the. Let me sort you two out. Thank you. Start with some. Mulberry, yeah, plenty of sauce. There we go. Thank you. John, are you going to have just sauce, oh, Anna? <laughs> and a bit of sourdough. Good stuff, James. Mm -hmm. How's the mussels? Delicious. What? That was absolutely delicious. I'm going to round two now, eh? Uh, give me your bowl, John. I'll get rid of those shells. Thank you. Oh. James's uh, 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 an essential with uh, mussels is... Pommes frites. Do you want some of this, Hannah? I'll have a little bit. So we've got the Thank last of your much. the last of your cherry tomatoes, shallots, a little bit of garlic, and uh, what, what the sweet of, Romano peppers, Romano peppers, and herby breadcrumbs, and smoked bacon and add-ons. Mm -hmm. Oh wow! Oh, them little tomatoes are like a little explosion of flavour. Oh. That is nice. Now, well, the, the empty plates speak for themselves. Mm. You've got a little bit there for your supper, Jim. Aye. Indeed. Um, I was saying this, even though the, the one with the breadcrumbs with the, um, I keep forgetting, did you say it was Romano peppers? Sweet peppers. Yes. Yeah. The, um, the one with the tomatoes and the peppers in it, it was absolutely stunning. The taste was, was just wonderful. That was oh. my particular favorite. I still feel like I, I I enjoyed the creamy one more. Um, I don't know what it was. You're seduced. Just very different. Cream. Both completely yeah. different. Weather. Very different dishes. But that's more to my mind. And of course, we knocked out some French chips as well, which are essential eating with uh, mussels, really. Uh, thank you very much, Jim. I did. Thank you for the <coughs> ingredients, John. I uh, hope you enjoyed joining us. All the very best. Well, see you later. See you some more. Bye. Bye. Bye.